We care. We care for people, people with AIDS. Why do we care, you might ask? We care because people with AIDS are people like us. We care. I think a care provider is everybody. It's people who don't, who've never met a person with AIDS, people who don't understand people with AIDS, people with AIDS, people who are their family members, their friends, everybody. I think that that has to be one of the hardest things that anyone can ask of you, is to be a care provider. It really is, it's tough, it's very hard to do. Um, it's emotionally draining most of the time. And you need a, a very strong source of, of strength and support. It can mean everything from the closest person, the person who's intimately, person who is sexually involved with someone who is aging positive, to someone who may only spend two hours of their life mm -hmm. in contact with somebody who's HIV positive. But that essentially in our society, and this is where I really agree with you at this point, can you imagine a person who will never be a care provider, who will never come into contact yeah. with somebody who has AIDS or is HIV positive? And if you're coming into contact, our hope is that you're caring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you're a care provider. Yeah. It doesn't really have to be a person. It could be a, I mean, care provider is like you're taking care or whatever. It might be a book that you're reading and it helps bring, you know, that calmness. It could be Watering your plants, talking to your plants. Yeah. Where's my cat? Where's my dog? <laughs> you know, whatever helps you. It's not like if you have AIDS written up in your forehead, it's a stamp. <laughs> well, this one has, it's HIV positive, uh, I can't go with it. It's not like that, you know? It not work that way. A person can look so healthy, and you'll be surprised, because I've seen people that it's blown my mind. I would be like, I can't believe this person is infected, and they look so well, and they look so healthy. That's why a lot of people get confused, you know? We care. We care for people, people with AIDS. Why do we care, you might ask. We care because people with AIDS are people like us. We care. I'm Marie, and I'm HIV positive. Welcome to my home. I would like to sort of let you see how it is living with the person that's HIV positive. We can go through the house and we can see what is in it and is not different from before, um, people tend to have misinformation or misconception that people as HIV positive should not be touched, talked to, or visited even. So please welcome and come in. This is my living room. It's the same as it always been. I need a new carpet, but that's another story. I would like to let it be known that not too much different is going on in my household in the last year and two and a half years. Um, my family, I have a son that's 22, and there's my partner, and I have my little three-year-old granddaughter that's with me most of the time. She's in Atlanta on vacation now, but we eat together. I cook everybody's food together. I tend to not let nobody use my glass because I've always been that way. My glass is my glass, my cup is my cup. I have a separate cup that I've had for years, you know. Uh, I I don't have separate pots and pans and dishes. I, the only difference that I do, I keep my vitamins and my medications here. There's a lot of vitamins and there's most of the vitamins. I keep my medications out of reach of my little three-year-old granddaughter, but then I kept my medications out of reach of three-year-old kids all along. I dropped uh, AZT one day and I couldn't find it and her little eyes being closer to the floor. Here, mommy, here it is. <laughs> so then I knew I had to be more alert as to what I'm dropping and make sure I pick it up. Uh, if 
if you can excuse the mess, everything else. But we do. We, I have a glass that I usually use just because I like certain glasses in a certain cup. Other than that, I wash my dishes, and I'm not into using Clorox for washing things. Or, I think people misunderstand the safety factor here. Uh, people come around me, if they have a cold, if they're not feeling well, they're more of a threat to me than I would ever be to them, uh, depending upon what they intend to do with me. You know, um, in the bathroom, the only difference that I make here is that I make sure the baby, when she's here, she take a tub bath all the time, every night. When I do take a tub bath, I make sure that the tub is cleaned out before and after. I clean it for my own safety, then I clean it for hers. I keep my washcloth up high, but then there and again, I've always not wanted nobody to use my washcloth. Her toothbrush is here, mine is on the other side. Uh, she know hers and she don't bother mine. Towers, I do when I take a bath, I do put my towers away. I don't want to leave them. Sometimes, you know, you leave them laying around and the kid will pick it up and you see a wipe in her face or something. And it's just general health habits that you have from growing up. The toilet I clean. My son is home from school this summer and I clean the toilet because I'm protecting me from him there again, more so than I would normally. Um, I don't have to shave. I'm a fortunate person. I have no hair, but <laughs> if I did, his razor is up. Uh, I don't use it, but we would keep it up because there's the da danger of cutting the nicks and blood passing back and forth. I don't have that big problem with a toothbrush brush because I can take my teeth out. So come into the bedroom and you'll see what's going on in here. I only have the one bed in my bedroom. That means that People can sleep together. Um, at this point, thank God, I am not, quote, sick. But I would suggest anybody that's caring for someone that's really sick, uh, that you might want to keep your soil material separate. Um, I do wash the baby's clothes separately, but I, I would do that anyway. I can't see where no one would get anything by sitting here, sleeping here with me, or walking in this room. And if it can help anybody to know that living with a person with the virus does not mean just totally uprooting your lifestyle and moving into separate apartments, separate states even, but you can get along. You, you, you must be use common sense, you know, and that's not just to do with the virus, it's to do with anything. That it'll work if you want it to. Well, I think that you can catch it just just by kissing alone. Okay, maybe you might not have the symptoms for a very, very long time, but I still think you can catch it that way. I, just like with um, BD or, you know, those other things, sitting on toilet seats or something, I think you could. It may not be as, get it as quickly or signs as quickly as you would with drug needle or through sex, but I think you still can get it that way. I really don't. Uh, through needles, um, through blood, um, sex, um, you could be born with it. We care. People with AIDS watch television with us. They live in our homes, eat our food, and share our clothes. They help us with homework, cooking, and cleaning. We care. The suggestion and the advice that I would give to someone who is trying to care for someone with HIV disease is to be supportive. But to also recognize the integrity of life not only within the person whose life you're worried about, but also within your own. It's important to take care of certain basics. You do not help clean up someone from the bathroom without having gloves on yourself. You're not out to prove that you can be super person. You're out to help another human being. If you are dealing with someone who has a large amount of blood and body fluids that are uh, constantly being lost, uh, such as vomiting, uh, diarrhea, uh, please read your precautions about how to adequately clean your house with uh, diluted water uh, and uh, Clorox. Um, 
but also recognize that giving a hug to someone who doesn't have those conditions and or is clean uh, will not in any way impair your own health. I often feel that much of the healing I do is because I happen to be a touchy-feely person. So all my patients get kisses and hugs. It's part of their treatment. I think it's also important to recognize that people, when faced with great obstacles, sometimes give up before they've even started to fight. Someone has to be there to help them say, oh no, you're not going to give up in this house. Not today. Not this year. You get up and you get it together. What is oftentimes difficult to understand about behavior, which can vary in someone with HIV disease, because what you might be actually seeing are very early signs of HIV involvement of the brain and the nervous system, are changes in personality. Those changes in personality may be depression, they may be a reactive kind of situation where someone is just feeling totally overwhelmed by their diagnosis and just can't work with it. Or remind that person of the other obstacles they have overcome in their life and continue to help them to gain the courage they need because there is no obstacle in this life from which we cannot learn, we cannot grow, and, 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 and during which we cannot be happy. We care. We care when we offer a helping hand, when we help you escape to movies, delis, books, TV, and just plain silence. We care. As a volunteer, first you gotta learn to ask people the specifics specify what they want you to do and go back to them and tell them when they're telling you to go out there and work all by yourself and you don't know what to do and don't think that you got to go out there and do it all by yourself and don't think you know you're going to know all the answers because you're not and be able to say I'm sorry I don't know how to know it now I can go to look for you find somebody and don't feel guilty that you can't do it all and don't feel guilty when you have moments of fear of a person that just think of that as, well, they're human just like me. And don't suddenly start looking at people with AIDS as, oh, there's something special about them. They don't do anything wrong. Realize, keep them as humans. That's right. <laughs> Otherwise, you sit there and you start, hi, how are you? And then you just sit there. And they're looking at you and you're looking at them. And you don't know what to say. And you're not treating them right. And you're not treating yourself right either. The tongue is, is a mighty thing. You can destroy a person's life just, just by you, you know, saying the wrong thing sometimes, you know? We, I hope this tape helps people out to, you know, there's no way you can catch that. The only way you can catch it is by, you know... Having sex, sex sharing needles. Uses. That's it. That's or the only way. That's the only way blood I transfusions. It, yeah. You can touch the blood, you know, but... And just so, if you give a person a hug, you ain't gonna catch it, you know? Right. We care. We care when you cry and die. We care by knowing when to stop and when to start. We care by treating people with dignity and respect. We care about our own well-being. We, we care. Affect you physically in any, any way? Yes, I do. In what ways? Well, let me tell you, in the night time I, I couldn't get my sleep, I would just think and think and think in school, I couldn't concentrate. I was attending school. I used to get pains on my stomach. Uh, all of a sudden, I would start crying for no reason. I, I, like I was in the class, but I wasn't there. And it, it does. It, it drains you out. It just drains you. It gives you pressure, headaches, anxiety. It gives you everything. And, and I think it gives you all this more because you have no one next to you. You have no support. Uh, your doors are shut, his doors are shut. That's very painful. I think the first thing you have to realize is that you're human too, you know, and you you need to care for yourself in order to be able to care for the individual who is not well, whether you have the virus or not. You really need to take care of yourself. You need to get the proper amount of rest, which is not always easy. Um, you have to watch your diet. You have to... Make sure you do some exercise just to release some tension sometime. That's necessary. Um, for me, I, I use my religion. 
uh, and when I'm not there, which isn't often, but when I'm not, it's my computer or the water um, that I find very tranquil, very, very peaceful. It's a way of releasing a lot of thoughts and feelings just or allowing myself to feel a lot of things that maybe I wouldn't feel comfortable feeling around the person that's not well, you know, who has the virus. You have to take a break at mm -hmm. some point in time. You must. Right, and you can't be, don't consider yourself superwoman and superman. Bouncing off buildings, bouncing off here and whatever. You, you gotta, like she said, you gotta take a break. Don't try to take on too much. Get away sometimes. So, and it's okay to feel, you know, that you have to get away. I mean, don't feel guilty because you say, oh my God, you know, this is too much. Don't feel guilty like that. It's okay to get away. It's okay to want some time to yourself. Everybody wants some time to themselves. It's hard to deal with because it's not a piece of cake and it's not peaches and cream, but you know, if you have that someone that you care for and you love and you can confine in, why not start to talk, you know, and open up? Because there has to be someone out there, it's, you know, even psychologists are helping the people yeah. out now, you know, you sit down and talk to them and release. Because uh, this, this uh, virus, it brings a lot of uh, depression and stress, and that will kill a person itself. Even a normal person, stress will kill them. So imagine yeah. a person with the virus. So you have to be stressless. You know? And not only the person that's infected the is, is it, it, you know, you get depressions. Even the person that's and negative, they, because I get discouraged and I get depressed and I go away. through my things too, but we can't give up, you know? We gotta keep going. It, I, I look at it like this is a war that I'm fighting. When we get under stress, a lot of times we tend to push our feelings down. And one good way to allow ourselves to have our feelings accessible to us, to feel what we actually are feeling, is to be able to relax and let go of some of the tension we accumulate. A good, a good technique to alleviate some of that tension is called deep diaphragmatic breathing. Deep diaphragmatic breathing means bringing your breath from your chest area because sometimes when you get anxiety provoked, a lot of breath hangs out in the chest area in here to be able to bring the breath a little further down into your abdominals. So basically, the dynamics are when you breathe in, your abdominals expand, and when you breathe out, your abdominals contract. Very much like a balloon. When you blow air into a balloon, the balloon expands. Let air out, the balloon contracts. So within the breathing technique, you'd like to use some visualization. When you breathe in, think of opening up to your situation. Think of opening up to your emotional feelings. Thinking of opening up to what's going on, what's present at the moment. With the exhale breath, acknowledge what it is and let it go. Inhale, opening up to some muscle tension in the body that you can experience when you're stressed out. Exhale breath, let the muscle tension go. Inhale, opening up to some anxiety, some fears about all the things that, that come up when you take care of someone. Open up to what's going on with you emotionally. And then with the exhale breath, acknowledge it and let it go. Using the breath as a vehicle to relax you, center you, and work with letting go of the tension so that you are clear, that you are able to actually take care of the person better because you are taking care of yourself first. Well, it's very difficult taking care of as many people as I do with this virus. And then to have some of the other crazy things that go on. So I sort of run away from home and I take a vacation at the water. That really helps a lot. It's very tranquil, it's very peaceful. I sort of, it's like washing my soul, you know? It sort of just cleanses me and then I feel very peaceful. And then I can get back out here and take care of them again. Macho myth. Macho myth. Macho myth. Women doesn't need condoms, and men feel to take away some of the pleasures. So, to forget about you. Macho man. A lot of it is machoism on the part of the males. 
um, I find that in working with Latino men, I get a lot of that's not for me attitude. They seem to have this phobia to latex. And women, they some of them are so weak-minded, they're just out to please their partner and not even thinking about themselves. So if he says that's the way it should be, they're so submissive that they say that's all right. That's the way it should be. And so if there's anything good coming out of the AIDS epidemic, it's that women are, fi women are finally empowering themselves to say, no, you can't treat me like this. We, we care. care. We care because people with AIDS are mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters. People with AIDS are children, lovers, husbands, wives, friends, and strangers. We, we care. Hi, my name is Marcia Edwards and I am the group facilitator and I'm also involved in the WAVE project. As a part of the video, I thought it would be important to mention that being a care provider one of the aspects that you need to think about is the fact that a person is going to die. And it's an uncomfortable subject, and we generally don't like to talk about it, but it's very important at some point in time to address the issue of death and dying, which may mean a few things. It may mean that you sit down with that person and you start talking about their feelings about death, dying, a living will, if the person has children, who's going to be responsible for the children, um, the significant other, their feelings, and you process that. And if you can't do that at the spot, you leave room to discuss it at some other point when your person is ready to do so. In terms of community resources, the very first place that you should start is your community religious organization, whether it's your church, uh, a pastor, a religious counselor, whatever your religious affiliation is, they are generally the first people that you should talk to about um, some of the spiritual aspects that you are willing to explore in this matter. Secondly, you should sit down with a funeral director. Um, most people are afraid of going to a funeral parlor and talking about uh, uh, what the caskets and the cost and dressing and preparing the body. If you would choose to go a regular funeral uh, uh, direction, go in, ask to speak to the manager, look at contracts, talk about monies, how you can afford to make payments. And there are general organizations that can help you to do that also in the community. Um, along with making the concrete plans, you also need to address the feelings that come up about talking with your significant others or the person that you're caring for about the whole process in itself. It doesn't mean that because you're talking about a living will or burying someone that you're doomed to die. It's, it's if, you, if you go out to buy a car, if you're going to buy a home, you look around and you try to get the best possible thing that, that suits your needs. And you look at it the same way. Illness is something that strikes anyone at any time. You really don't know, so it's best to be prepared. And uh, most of all, open, honest conversation helps you make your decisions and helps you pull you through the process easier. And in the long run, it's much better off for the family. Thank you. You can get it by hugging. You can get it by sitting on the You can get it by eating. You can get it by touching hands. By touching hands. Touching hands. Touching hands. Touching hands. You can get it from mosquitoes. Shaking hands. Wearing the same clothes. Being near them. I, mean, I think everyone is afraid A little, of AIDS. I guess, yeah. Because if I say that I'm not, I'm lying. Everyone is afraid. But I know how someone can get infected. You understand? Because if it was this way, I, I don't even, maybe I wouldn't have even gone as far as I've gone, you know? And by ha having a meal and a table, you're not going to get infected, well, if you I know? Had, if I had any doubt that I would be endangering my, you know, my kids or my wife, I wouldn't, wouldn't be with my wife and kids. I wouldn't do that. And I guess if you could just get people to understand that you won't get it by shaking my hand, you know? If that was the way, my Lord, everybody in the world would have it. We care. We care because they are a part of us. So please, won't you care? To a lot of people, they're not as lucky as we are that they've tapped in to AIDS. 
the AIDS community, that's what we call it, right? Because they may live in a place where there isn't an AIDS community or they may not have yet figured out where to go. And I think that, if anything, it's that feeling too, that, there are, that there's a whole world out there suddenly, which is sad, there's this AIDS world, but there is this AIDS world where you can go and meet people who are going through the same thing you are, where you can find support, where you can get things you need, that there are services for you, that there are therapists, that there are groups, that, and that there are other people mm -hmm. Who you can just sit down and have a conversation with because I think there's a lot of people who are very isolated still. You know it, it's had a, a great impact in my life where a lot of my friends their backgrounds are you know they are either IV users and there's a lot of young girls that I know that have even gotten into prostitution and it's you know it's a thing that they feel that well I have AIDS and that's the end you know but I want to let them know that it's not the end you know, that there is help out there, that there are different type of services and programs that they can get involved into, especially for women. Hi, my name is Sharon and I'm a caregiver. And my name is Glenda and I'm an AIDS educator. And we're here to tell you about some of the services that are available to you as a newly diagnosed PWA or as a caregiver. Uh, the most important thing for you to realize is that you're not alone. There are many different services available to you and it's important that you tap into the network of people who are doing things to empower themselves to get rid of that hopeless and helpless feeling and be able to give yourself the kind of care that you need so that you're able to care for the person who is newly diagnosed. The most important thing in my opinion for, for a caregiver is that he or she tap into a really good support group. It's important that you have your own network of friends and, and support systems so that during those days when things are not going so great, you have a place to release some of those feelings and frustrations. Um, there are a wide range of support services available to you and Glenda will tell you about those. Okay, some of the services that are available to you are services such as social services and entitlements and what we mean by that is that entitlements means Medicaid, Medicare, uh, public assistance, food stamps, whatever fall in that category. Other services include support groups and counseling for yourself or for the person you're caring for, experimental drug treatment programs, and of course, legal services. Again, we can't stress enough that you're not alone. And don't take it as if you're alone, but you have to be plugged into the network. You have to be plugged into an agency to receive the services. And again, as she said, you're not, you're not alone. alone. I'll tell you something. It is so stupid and so silly for people to shop at the worst when you need it most. Your own family, my own sister didn't go see my brother in his apartment. They didn't visit him in the hospital. Why the hell are they so afraid? I don't know. I have my kids. I have a 12 year old daughter and I wasn't scared. I didn't even think that I was jeopardizing their life. I just, I said my brother needs help. And here I am, I should give it to him regardless no matter what happens. I just feel like people are so ignorant. And not only ignorant, they just don't care. I mean, we're here for such a small time. Why don't we live like brothers and sisters? Like human beings, you know? We're not dogs to be out there treated like dogs. We're human beings. And even a dog, you still take care of him. And you give him love. No, I just want to be there for people. And I want to be able to make a difference in somebody's life and, and knowing that they're not alone. You know, that there are people out there that care for them, that, that love them. And it's important to know that people care enough for you. You know, and I can sort of take a little bit. Sometimes I want a little of that smothering and stroking anyway. You know. I, I at times do feel not good with this. And at that time, I, I need a little stroking. Um, but then you have to know when to stop, because I, I don't eat much, you know. Uh, I'll push away, and then you need to stay away when I do that. But then come back the next day and stroke again, you know. 
that's about it for what I would need and not need from a caregiver. It's a hard, hard word to describe, but it's just anything, anyone that helps, right. you know, on any level. Mm -hmm. So you're left open for millions of people there to fit that bill. We, we care. care. We care for people, people with AIDS. Why do we care, you might ask. We care because people with AIDS are people like us. We care. People with AIDS watch television with us. They live in our homes, eat our food, and share our clothes. They help us with homework, cooking, and cleaning. We care. We care when we offer a helping hand, when we help you escape to movies, delis, books, TV, and just plain silence. We care. We care when you cry and die. We care by knowing when to stop and when to start. We care by treating people with dignity and respect. We care about our own well-being. We, we care. We care because people with AIDS are mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters. People with AIDS are children, lovers, husbands, wives, friends, and strangers. We, we care. We care because they are a part of us. So please, won't you care?